Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bunaktu Sahavir Yankarawa Wahe Tejas Vinavati Tamastu Ma Vidvisha Wahe Om Shanti 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 Okay, verse 18. We talked about Sharira and Shariri. So the body that is sitting down now on a chair, the body that's, or the mind uh, with which is, these words are being listened to, this is your Sharira. Uh, it is the instrument by which you navigate in this world, by which you make decisions, uh, by which you experience desire, uh, through which uh, things get accomplished. And the instrument that is given to you to think right now. So uh, this instrument is amazing. It's sophisticated and it can uh, be, you know, exercised for many things. And it's endowed with three powers. Your instrument, you, that instrument of yours is uh, capable of desiring. Uh, it's, for example, right, there's a certain desire why you've shown up here and right, whatever, next week or some other time, it can desire not to, right, engage or something. So it can desire to engage or not engage. And this is all uh, an endowment to this sharira. And it also can um, work things out. So I can say something and your instrument, which is your endowment, it's your blessing. It can think about what is the, right, how does this relate to me? And how do I, you know, make my life better? How do I enrich my life with this knowledge? So it can furthermore, uh, it can act. It's, you know, it's endowment to uh, Kriya Shakti. Kriya Shakti is to take this things that you worked out in your mind and it can just go into the world and make a few adjustments and it can, you know, it can really enrich your life and bring some, you know, blessings in your life. Um, and then it can also find out this is not working. And you can say, hmm, I need to know something. So this is Jnana Shakti or Jnana Shakti. Jnana Shakti means it can uh, come to ascertain things that it hasn't known before. Uh, I'll give an example. Like AI is amazing right nowadays. I'm, I'm an early adopter in technology. So, <laughs> And uh, with AI, um, you can now do conversations and you, know, you can like tell AI, say, hey, I want to learn about the universe. And I want you to be my teacher. And I'm just going to ask you questions and keep your sentences very short because my brain cannot absorb too much information. Keep it under three points maximum. Um, and then allow me to ask you more questions and explain a little bit. And then allow me again to ask you questions about that. And I just had a conversation with this. And I tell you, in one day with this kind of conversation back and forth, I learned more than in five years. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, this is amazing because you can customize it to teach you exactly how you want it to be taught, right? You can say, stop, that's too much information. What do you mean by this? For example, so I said to this AI, using this Sharira, right? I said, hey, how does a virus work? Like what happens? We just get sick and we go to the doctor. Do you even know what happens when a virus takes place? We don't, right? We, 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 we don't, like 40, 50 years later, we don't know. So it says... The most common virus, I said, what's the most common? It says rhinovirus. Okay, so just imagine a big rhino. So imagine a big rhino. And I said, well, how does rhinovirus work? Well, it attaches to the inlining of your nose. And I said, okay, and to, and to your throat. And I say, and then to what cells does it attach to? And it says ep ep epithelial cells. Oh, okay, so what's an epithelial cell? Well, an epithelial cell is like any other cell. It has a, 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 you know, a nucleus and a mitochondria. And I say, oh, okay, so then how does this rhinovirus actually accept or go or infect this epithelial cell since cells naturally reject uh, alien cells? They, they reject those, um, uh, you know, malign cells. And it says, oh, the rhinovirus has a protein that tricks the epithelial cells, which are on the lining of your inner nose. And the epithelial cells think, oh, this is good stuff for me. I want some of this. And so the epithelial cells sucks in this rhinovirus. And I says, okay, wait a minute. This is too much information already for me. What happens next? What happens next? And he says, well, the, the rhinovirus is like a genetic code. 
all it has is genetic code called uh, mRNA. And this genetic code is like, whoa, what is genetic code now? And he says, just think of it as just like binary digits. And I said, well, how does this now replicate into a virus? Well, this genetic code lands onto the mitochondria, uh, not the mitochondria, to the ribosome. And I say, whoa, what is the ribosome? Ribosome is that which manufactures proteins. So I said, so when this DNA, when this, uh, uh, this um, uh, um, uh, uh, mRNA lands onto the ribosome, you're saying that this ribosome, which produces protein, will now produce another virus? Exactly. And I said, how does this happen? He says, ah, easy. So this ribosome will take the amino acids. Well, stop. What is an amino acid? Amino acid is the stuff from which a protein is made. Ah, continue. And it says it takes amino acids. Stop. How many amino acids are inside the cell? 20. And it takes one of these 20 amino acids. And I said, well, before you continue, are you telling me that every single cell in the world has 20 amino acids? Yes. You're saying that every living organism, including a species of fish and ant and spider and germ and body and monkey and tiger all has 20 amino acids? Yes. Wow. This is amazing. So this means every living being in the universe has 20 amino acids inside its cells. And from these 20 amino acids, you take a combination, maybe amino acid one and five and three, and you bring it into the ribosome and you make a protein according to that rhinovirus. And then what happens when the rhinovirus is now made? Well, it bursts out of the cell. And does the cell die afterwards? Yes, it does. And is this why we feel tired? Yes, we do. Why do we feel tired? Because the, your cells have died and your cells produce energy for your body. And those cells are now being destroyed by cre creating these new cells. So you just keep on going and going and going. I tell you, this everything I said to you, I remember 100%. Why? Because I customized it to talk my language. 20 amino acids, epithelial cells, rhinovirus. This is just one topic. And then I talked about space. How does the creation of the universe happen? Oh my God, this is a one hour conversation we had. Everything word for word, I remember. So how is all this done through your Sharira? Your Sharira has amazing capacity. If you just align it, tune it to work according to how it's made. Because you may listen, somebody else may need to see, somebody else needs to work things out. But we all have our own private ways of learning and digesting and understanding. And therefore, it is the duty of the Sharira to discover its own ways of assimilating data. And this blew me away, I tell you. I thought, my God, I've got all these books on my shelf. And they're all about space, astronomy, biology. But I haven't like read any of them. And this is kind of how it is for us. We just shelves, right? Full of books. And then you just engage in this conversation and you learn right? You learn in one day or five days more than you learn in five years. How did this take place? I enacted my power to desire. And then my power, my, uh, my, my, my Iksha Shakti, it's also in doubt to you. I enacted my power to do my Kriya Shakti. I actually did something. I enacted my power to, to, to know. And therefore, these powers put together in a way that works for you can do wonders. And with this exact same Sharira, you can attain moksha. Gary? No question. Does it ever make mistakes? It, uh, you have to be very specific in your prompts and you, right, you know, use some common sense and listen carefully and ask questions. Um, and usually I'll say things like, according to all of the knowledge in the world of biology and um, psychology or whatever, right? Um, Having read all of the technical papers and having taught, you know, students yourself and always thinking step by step, um, what is the answer? So I will tell it slowly how to think. So rather than just being general, be very specific. In that case, you reduce the amount of hallucinations. So, Andre, that's so interesting because I'm I'm also kind of uh, very curious about things like using AI and I was using it to 
ask questions about Vedanta and specifically the Bhagavad Gita and saying, you know, hey, put this into really simplistic terms and give me the main point of each chapter and how do I apply it in my daily life and what if I have this, like, so what are your thoughts about using it yeah. to study Vedanta? Is it is it good? Is it dangerous? Like, yeah. what do you what do you think so far? Obviously, I've tested this and worked on this. Um, and I, I don't use it um, unless I feed it with text from a book like Swami Dainanda chapter. And then I'll say, based on this text of somebody else, I want to ask questions and I want you to answer specifically according to the vocabulary of this text that I gave you. Otherwise, it's going to draw all these resources from everyone else, right? And it's going to be soul. And it's like, what? We don't use the word soul. And, you know, and, and it's going to start mixing up all of these words. And thereby, uh, for that reason, you have to be either very, very specific. For example, I want you to specifically answer me questions according to Swami Dainanda tradition, Arshavidya. Um, having read all the Adi Shankara, Shankara's um, Bhashyam, uh, all of the major Upanishads and Brahma Sutra, Based on that specifically, I want you to be very strict with your vocabulary and answer the questions, making it very relevant, but also in a way that I can um, simplifying it without taking out the essence. So in that sense, you have to be very precise uh, how you want to ask the questions. Otherwise, um, I, I don't use it for Vedanta so much for the very reason that I find Vedanta needs to be very subtle and refined. Um, so there are some topics that, right, you can more tangible things like science, geography, biology, many things you can ask it questions, even philosophy. But when it comes to these very subtle matters, it, it, I, I found it in my experience, I have to guide it. And if I don't guide it, it goes on a tangent. So I have to specifically say, right, I have to, I have to bring words in. And then it will only follow, then it will follow that thread. Yeah, so I just want to put this in a package. What I'm really saying is, see, it's very easy to use a sharira and discard things, right? And like you can do anything with it, or you can really recognize the value of things and use it, see where you go. Um, but at the same time, right, hold that discernment. Like, where is I don't want to now too much rely on, you know, you know, technology or this has to be some balance between human connection and technology, but it's never sort of this black or white, right? I don't need human beings anymore or this. So it's a beautiful balance of both. I made it a wonderful companion uh, in my life by getting it to constantly ask me questions and to feedback um, what I have to say. And then it feeds back uh, what it thinks about how well I did. So like this, you have a back and forth exchange and it teaches you to speak better, to explain better, to think better, and uh, allows you to see some of those nuances that you missed out. My question is, I'm a little bit uh, off tangent. So my, I, I was just wondering, um, is it possible that a brain can produce or generate somehow uh, mind and not 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 the consciousness. I mean that's entirely different. But mind because uh, as the brain develops, uh, mind also develops, right? Because mind is when, when you're born, mind is not fully developed, and as your brain is developing, so does the mind. So what would be that logic we can use to say, hey, brain doesn't uh, somehow generate mind? which is both are matter, one subtle and one gross, and yeah. consciousness being different. The mind doesn't really develop. The mind's just waiting for the brain to develop. So because you've been carrying this mind with you for a long time, and this mind just waits for the host body, for your brain to develop enough so that the mind can fully start to operate. So this means that this is why um, a, you know, a child doesn't have their strong sense of eye sense. It's not like the mind doesn't have the eye sense. You've been carrying the eye sense for, you know, since beginningless time. And this eye sense, when it uh, finally has proper physical physicality to express itself through, then the individual is able to kind of say more, I am this individual and it's different from the world over there. So the brain um, simply is uh, um, 
a method by which this mind, which is subtle, can express itself. Without the brain, the, the subtle body cannot, you know, it cannot quite convert its thoughts into actions. It can still think, but it cannot convert it into uh, any kind of um, tangible actions that are useful for you. So this means that you need the physical body in order to develop the subtle body, the subtle mind. The subtle mind has thoughts, has desires. How is it going to express that without a physical brain? Because the physical brain is required for arms to move, right? Now, if I don't, have, if I don't have arms to move, then right, I cannot quite go into the world and, and work things out and therefore help my subtle body, my mind. But isn't uh, subtle body all different types of thought form, including uh, the eye sense? And then as, as with your experiences uh, and perceptions uh, through your sense organs, you develop more and more thought forms, which means you're developing your mind as well, which is the subtle body. Correct. So as I said, the subtle body, by inherit, by coming inside, by penetrating the brain, it is able to change because right there's a body mind connection so if i give you a, um, a physical pill that affects the brain the dopamine and affects the physical brain it will in some sense affect your thoughts too so there is definitely a body mind connection because after all they are sharing the same order of reality which is matter the only difference is that your physical brain is sub is phys is um uh, a physical matter and your, uh, your mind is your uh, subtle matter. In fact, uh, it's very interesting now, you reminded me, I was asking, uh, you know, what's the brain made of? And it's, you know, it was talking about basically, right? We can't go into too much details, just basic neurons. And, uh, and these neurons, right? Just a whole bunch of neurons about, what is it? About 50% of your brain is just neurons. And then you say, what is a neuron made of? And it's made of atoms. Now, where is a thought inside an atom? Atoms don't have thoughts because the atoms that made that rock outside your door is the very same atoms that make up your neurons, which are by their connection, they produce thoughts, right? Not that they produce, they allow thoughts to operate through them. Look at this. So this means you cannot find anywhere in any one of your neurons. If you cannot find a thought or an emotion in one single neuron of your brain, and your brain is made up of billions, trillions of neurons just like that, then which neuron will you find a thought? You won't find a thought in any neuron because a neuron is just an atom. Atoms are just electrons, particles. So this means there is a different kind of matter. And this matter, which we call your mind, desire, where are you going to find a desire inside a neuron? Go on. Try and find a desire. What is a desire? What is it going to look like? What is a desire when you find it inside a neuron going to look like? <laughs> it's not going to look like anything because the only thing you're going to find is just more atoms, right? So this means body-mind connection. The mind requires the physical brain, a bunch of atoms to work through and express your, your life and make your, enrich your life and discover your true nature, that that which actually illumines this this subtle body, this this thinker, this desirer, this wanter, this uh, this you know doer, uh, this killer. We said hantaram last week. That which illumines, lights up this sense of uh, this individual is this uh, ever present, ever awareful uh, I Atma. Thank you. Now, one more thing I want to bring up is that, see, in Vedanta, a common mistake that gets made is that when a person says, you know, Atma is the observer, the most common mistake is that the person takes their eye sense, the Ahamkara, to be the observer. This is very common in therapy, like um, ACT or acceptance commitment therapy. It's just a form of therapy where you basically, what you do is you tell to your patient, uh, just witness your thoughts. Look at your thoughts passing by. And the, pa and the patient's like, yeah, this is wonderful, right? I'm looking at my thoughts. Now, the reason why psychology does this is it's useful. It has its use. It has, it's got its application to right, look at the, the thoughts, the painful thoughts, which are very hard to manage sometimes, just to 
look at them like waves in the ocean, right? They're just crashing. They're passing by. New waves are coming. You don't go over there and try to stop the waves or try to break the waves. You just look at the waves and you say, that is the nature of thoughts. The nature of thoughts is to come manifest, to crash. Another wave comes. And then the, the therapist will tell you, just look at that whole phenomena going on. And then just, you know, look at it and go recognize that's the nature of the mind. Now, the person would then go, ah, so this observer, right? Me, the, the present, the conscious observer, am now looking at my thoughts. Therefore, who am I? I am that conscious observer. But what is the conscious observer referring to? It's actually referring to the I sense. It's referring to the ahamkara, to the ego. So there is an individual, right? who is uh, looking at their thoughts. The ego, the ahamkara is looking at their thoughts. And I think now I am that final reality. So what happened here? False attribution. In other words, I mistook atma as just one more component of the mind. So how to now kind of get out of this mistake? How to understand this? The wise person understands that, yes, there is an observer. Okay, you can observe you and okay, how about we do a little exercise just quickly before I move on. Okay, let's take a breath right now. And I want you to remember as much as you can about what happened yesterday. And just look at those images in your mind about what happened yesterday, conversation with someone or something you did and observe that. Keep observing that. Good. Now, the observer, you can stop observing. The observer is called the ahamkara. Whoever was observing that, that's called the ahamkara. That which enables the observation to take place is atma. The presence in whom that observer was taking place is consciousness, which is your final truth. Where is that observer now? That observer is still here looking at this video. Now, that observer, we call the relative observer, right? Now, if something happens, something terrible happens, that observer will be affected, right? So well, suppose someone next to you, close to you dies, and that's very painful. That observer that was observing those memories just now will be under pain. Can you relate to this? Yeah, but isn't observer the um, is still like it's the I sense plus this uh, part in the self, like the, the the thing which you explained with as confined um, uh, consciousness. So the observer specifically, I was referring to is the uh, the the hamkara. The ahamkara or the buddhi, they're both one and the same. The buddhi and the ahamkara, the essence, has the ability to observe its own thoughts. That which enables the ahamkara to observe is consciousness. You can't grasp it. This is the thing. So now, suppose you have, what are you talking about? I can't grasp it. You don't have to grasp it. Just the fact that there is an observation going on, just the fact that there is a knower of thoughts, the final knower is consciousness. How do I recognize this? Through knowledge alone. I don't have to experience or grasp this consciousness. I just recognize through knowledge, whatever you want to call it, whatever enables this observer to see thoughts, to see this conversation, to hear this conversation, whatever you want to call it, that is the final reality. So ultimately, the final observer, it's not ahamkara. The final observer is Atman itself, your true nature. Can I grasp that Atman? No, I can't. How is that Atman known to you? As your evident I am, which you don't need to observe. Do you need to observe your right, yourself right now to know that you are? Do, do, do you need to like enable the observer right now? Whether the observer is enabled or not, you still are. Whether the observer is observing a memory from yesterday, you still are. And what happens to this observer? I know, Gautam. What happens to this observer during deep sleep? Is that observer still there? 
this this no not not the, uh, uh, the consciousness is this observer who was near, there so much looking at this memory that we just did a few minutes ago where is that observer that ahamkara in your deep sleep you see gone therefore not i anatma but if there's one thing that remains in deep sleep it is myself otherwise who would go to sleep knowing that i would be going out of existence therefore you cannot be this ahamkara, this, this relative observer. Otherwise, you would be afraid of going out of existence in deep sleep. But you're not. You gladly go to deep sleep. Why? Because you want to get rid of the relative observer, the person. We call it just the person, the hantaram, the doer, the, the, the jiva, right? Just the, the individual, whatever you want to call it. Gone. I want to get rid of the relative observer, the relative individual, the relative thinker, the relative analyzer, the relative emoter, the relative knower. I want to get rid of all of that. All of that gets rid of in deep sleep. Thank you. Andre, is it gone? Or yes, Yali. Is it gone or is it just in your subconscious? Um, okay, so God and subconscious, we use two words. Okay. The nature of God is this consciousness, which I'm talking about, which remains in your deep sleep. Um, your subconscious is specifically referring to your memory, which is your chittam. Uh, subconscious specifically refers to those childhood memories that you don't remember, but they still govern your life. This is your subconscious. Okay. So is it is it God? It's the nature of God, which is consciousness, is right the final reality and when i say it's the yeah, final, I, I, when i, I say I, it's the final reality what i specifically mean it is that which in whose presence observations happen for all of us i just wanted to i i have uh, you know wandered over this for a while and there is uh, uh, thankfully you have touched this topic and i just want to raise a question so uh, i understand what you have said uh, that we uh, the consciousness is the ultimate subject. So you cannot uh, objectify the ultimate subject. You cannot grasp it because it itself is the ultimate subject. Therefore, you cannot say uh, that, you know, uh, I am the knower. You know, you cannot say the consciousness cannot be attributed to be knower because then you are grasping the consciousness. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Yeah. So therefore, in this context, I wanted to ask, the neti neti prakriya finally tells you that you know what is observing what has been left out is anatma and now what is left the knower is the atma so is there a conflict between what the neti neti prakriya is saying and what you have just said is there a con conflict between this no because the purpose of neti neti is to shake up this initial mixture where we have our sharira so deeply entrenched in our shariri, our, our consciousness. So therefore, you have to first start to negate all of these things that I have right, innocently mixed up, right? I am, I am, my true nature is shariri, consciousness, and yet I've dumped all of these notions, desires and fancies and, uh, you know, the relative knower, which I take as, as everyone else does, right, as the final truth, all of these things I have to recognize, first of all, they have a place. They're not to be discarded. You don't have to discard them or throw them away. Just recognize them. They have a certain order of reality. They have a certain place. And when I recognize it through my buddhi, I recognize it as a certain place. My buddhi has a certain place. My thoughts have a certain place. My emotions have a certain place. My body has a certain place. My desires have a certain place. That's all I'm doing, just recognizing what it is. I don't even need to discard it. Just see it for what it is. The presence in whom all of these things, these things that I mentioned, are taking place and molding and shaping and going through desires and fancies and likes and dislikes and pain and joys and worries and concerns and aspirations and falling in love and fall, falling out of love. And then again, worried. And then a whole cycle just repeats. A mixture of a thousand different changes happening throughout your entire life. All of this has a place. This is what we call the sharira, the body. The one in whose presence these changes are occurring is my true nature consciousness. 
In other words, you can never have a change that is observed to be taking place unless there is a changeless principle, a changeless consciousness. It's just logic. You can't recognize changes unless there's something about you which is not changing. So, uh, uh, can I elaborate, request Please. you to elaborate a little further because it's very confusing for me for so long. Okay. So, basically, after Neti Neti, what is left is the basic essence. So, that is what we are referring to as Drishta because, you know, what is left is again graspable. So, therefore, even Drishta has to be discarded later. Yeah, okay. So, see, this is a nice logic you're pointing out. Okay, I'm just going to take us all of us through a little methodology because Gautam is uh, bringing a new methodology. So in Drg Drsha Viveka, we have a certain methodology and I'll simplify it for all of us just so we can be guided. So if you look at like this cup, right? This cup is being seen by, this cup is the, the, the scene. It's seen by what? The seer. What is the seer now of this cup? Your eye, physical eye, right? I'm not going to use Dirk Drisha, just more Sanskrit words. Keep it simple, right? So this cup is seen. That, and what is the color of this cup? It's red. Does your seer, the eye, does the eye take the attributes of this cup? Red, no. And if this cup becomes big or becomes small, does the physical eye, the seer, become big or small? No. So this means the seer never takes on the attributes of the scene. Simple logic. The drk, seer, never takes on drshya's attributes. Drshya means scene. Now, drk drshya viveka goes one step further. It says, okay, now your physical eye or your ears, it doesn't matter. They themselves go through a lifetime of long-sightedness, short-sightedness, Sometimes you wake up, you, you know, your eyes are just not, you know, you, they don't see very well. Or your ears, right? When you were a child, they were hearing very well. Now they don't hear so well. Now, so in other words, now what knows, what recognizes the attributes of the conditions of the eyes? The mind. Understand so far? Now, when the eyes become blind, does the mind become blind? When the eyes have long, like, you know, ve see very well, suppose in the morning, and they're very sharp, is your mind necessarily sharp? No. So this means, again, now the eyes become the drshya, the see, and the mind becomes the drk, the seer. So same logic. The seer never takes on the attributes of the scene. In other words... The seer eye never takes on the attributes of the seen cup. The seer mind never takes on the attributes of the seen senses. And then this is where we most stop. This is where we all stop. Oh, so the mind is the final reality. And then Drk Drshya Viveka brings the final. And it says, now, same logic. Your mind goes through states of knowership. It knows itself to be in the morning, oh, I'm, I'm a loser. Look at this. Ahamkara is now a loser. Tomorrow, you get a promotion. Ah, oh, I'm a winner. All of this stuff is changes of the mind. Are they not? Conditions of the mind. So the ahamkara, the knower, is going through different emotions, different conditions, different opinions about itself. And what is the witness? What is now the final seer of this mind? The final seer becomes... Atman consciousness. So this means now the loser or the winner doesn't spill onto the final seer, which is consciousness. So all we want to point out is that there's a certain place to your mind. There's a certain place for your senses. There's a certain place for your world. Let it be. Leave it alone. Just recognize that none of these attributes spill onto the final knower to the final reality, which is consciousness in whose presence different attributes of the mind take place. Different states of this knower take place. The good knower, the loser knower, the fantastic knower, the brilliant knower, the, the, the educated knower, the dull knower. Let it 
let it be. The knower is going to go through many changes. My knower when I was small was silly. How was your knower when they were small, when this body was small? Goofy, right? Silly, not very well educated, low self-esteem knower. And look at the knower now. Look at the knower now. Now the knower is so much more educated about the world. And what else does the knower know? What does the knower of the wise person recognize? That which lights up this relative knower, this relative person is the final consciousness. It's just knowledge. No, not an experience, just cognitive understanding. So uh, may I ask one more question? Oh, go on, Gautam. So uh, when we are doing this negation, is that negation being done by the eye sense? Yes. So the negation, very nice. So you need the mind to, to like anything, to recognize that uh, this Drik Drishya, what has done this inquiry? This Drik Drishya inquiry, what has done it? Brain. The brain, the brain. mind, the mind. And then the mind used this very pramana to finally negate itself. I am not the final reality. I am that which is, right? I'm lit up by something else. And that something else is not subject to all of the conditionalities of the mind. So the mind needed to be used in order to negate itself. And when it negates itself through knowledge, not experientially, oh, I have no mind anymore, I can't think. Not just through knowledge, understanding. What lights up my mind is the final consciousness, which is lighting up your very mind, which is undergoing a million changes throughout life, which is fine. This is how reality is. I don't have to get away from it. I don't have to change it. I don't have to complain about it. I just recognize it for what it is. And I get on with my life. So, one last so the mind was definitely required. So one last question. Sorry uh, to Thank get you on. involved into you know all this. Mm -hmm. So uh, therefore, we do we make a distinction between I, the knower, and the final knower? Is it okay to say like this? Yes, yes. So the so in other words, this is the final discrimination, uh, which is cognitive in nature, right? The knower, as I said, Gautam goes through changes in their life, the relative knower, right? I, the relative knower, it goes through changes. As I said, your small knower, how was your small knower, right, many years ago? It was not so confident. It was not so, right, so kind of up, you know, whatever. It was different. Now, your knower, right, your person, your Gautam person, the knower Gautam, the person, is very different in nature, very different, different desires, different, right, different ideas, different aspirations. All of that is just the mind. But there's one presence in whose presence this mind is uh, changing, molding, sculpting, going through things, uh, coming out of its, uh, you know, its you know, self-imposed limitations. So this means your very mind finally releases you from your mind. Your very um, mind releases you from your mind. And it recognizes that you were never under the spell of this mind. You will never under the spell of this mind. Um, uh, Andre, uh, sorry, had the follow up on. Hold on, Vijay, yeah. Vijay had a question first. Okay. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, uh, yeah, Andre, um, you mentioned in the in deep sleep, all these other, uh, the uh, eye sense, uh, everything is gone. Is it gone or is it kind of dormant? Because when you wake up again, it's all back, right? Sure. Uh, that's one. And in deep sleep, uh, I think from what you just said, deep sleep, we don't, we feel very good because there are no objects, no objects, no mind, nothing. And um, that final knower, the consciousness, when you really wake up, maybe enlightenment or whatever you call, in that state also, is it like um, you see everything, but there are no objects kind of state state of deep sleep is the state of real enlightenment um okay so i think it was a two part question first of all whether you call it gone or temporarily resolved it's just not there that's the idea it's not there it's not it's not functional it's because there's no object so there's no there's nothing to see and it's just taking a play it's taking a rest and deep sleep for this reason right, is required to replenish you, the mind and 
the body. That's how it's made, just to take a little rest. And this is why you feel uh, you're so refreshed. The second uh, question is that um, sleep is a good example of non-duality, um, but it's not it's it's not true non-duality because in deep sleep, um, what happens is you're actually in a um, right. The person is in a potential state, right? You're you're. It's it's exactly like when the world dissolves, when this entire universe resolves. It's exactly like deep sleep. You're just in a much longer deep sleep. Um, however, see, you're still in a sort of a kind of a dormant state, right? It's a good example of non-duality. So it's a tool, but is it is it what enlightenment is? Not at all, because you don't know anything. You're you don't even know who you are, right? So enlightenment doesn't require right this deep sleep experience at all, because through knowledge you understand that even if um, I one space, right? One space seem confined, actually, cognitively understand it is all over. The, the real nature of I is all over. So whether I get temporarily like this, you know, a little cap called deep sleep and I don't know anything, it doesn't matter because that's how the universe is made. Just to give you a little break, but nothing has really changed. You are still all pervasive. Okay? So this means that... Um, right the 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 wise person the reason why i keep saying it's not an experience because look at this all pervading space right we're using our comparison is like atma consciousness the space right now here and here look at this it's the same space what happened what's the only difference i just added one little what's called upadi one little one little body upadi that's it but look at this, all pervading, I am. I still am, but in reference to, right? It seems like I am in reference to this much, okay? That's it. So this means I don't have to now negate this. Oh, let me negate the whole uh, body, you know? I just have to understand, it's there. Let it be. It's like in a dream. It's there. You, the characters are there. The mountains are there. But cognitively understand the whole thing is just a manifestation of one reality. So even this little party is made of the same substance as is the entire universe, as is the as is consciousness. So imagine it like this. Consciousness is like this space, right? And this cup is also made out of same space. I know it's a little bit funny logic, but it's also made out of space, right? So not only is everything space but this is also space but this space we call body in other words right it's manifesting like a body and so when it appears here when it grows it seems like all pervading space is now confined by by this little cup so this is why we say when the sharira which is nothing but consciousness it's just a manifestation of consciousness your body it's nothing but consciousness right now. This is why I say Gautam. You don't have to negate. It is a tool. But ultimately, what a wise person does is not negate. They just understand what is there to negate. It's one reality. Negating was only provisional. Yeah. But then you come to the final understanding. Wait a minute. What am I negating? The body itself is nothing but consciousness. An appearance of consciousness. And therefore, you then let go of this neti neti. So neti neti was also just a tool. And when it's done its job, you let go of neti neti also. The observer can be observed as well. Or, yeah, so you, you can do this infinitely. You can yeah. have observer, observing the observer, observing the observer. It doesn't really matter. You can never, right? The point of this discussion is in whose presence is all of these attempts to observe the observer taking place? It's taking place in one consciousness. So you can go out of your mind trying to observe the observer, trying to observe, trying to observe, going back and back and back and back. You will never touch your true self. Your true self is the presence in whose presence there's a frustrated person who's desperately trying to grasp that which is ungraspable. Right. Okay. So in that context, 
can we differentiate between individual consciousness and you know cosmic consciousness or is the same so no um individual good good question i'm also individual consciousness that the nature of your individual consciousness is the exact same nature of my individual consciousness just like the nature nature of space right suppose this is consciousness inside right inside this cup is it really inside this cup i'm all the space is yeah. space really inside this cup no. Hmm? no no in other words right it only seems to be inside while the cup exists but actually look at this it's exact same space right it's exact attributely space so now you have a mole's body and a mole says i am what is this i am referring to ultimately the same space sure. when Andre says I am with his own Sharira also has space inside. So the I am, the consciousness is always the same between uh, all individuals in the past, the present and the future. Um, uh, Sorry, Andre. Um, so, I mean, I'm just still a little bit uh, confused on the knower, the ego aspect, uh, aspect the knower. So like the knower is uh, or the eye sense it's all part of subtle body when you say knower it is also an object right and when it when when the consciousness uh, pervades it it becomes a sentient knower otherwise it's just uh it's an object right correct so far is that the right correct so far so so far okay. uh, go on yeah so now uh the question is so everything that is happening, all the knowledge that is taking place, uh, all the Vedanta, it's all an object, and uh, right. And the when we say final seer or the final knower, which you were talking about, the final knower you are referring to the consciousness, consciousness. But that consciousness itself, it it doesn't. It just uh, as far as I understand, it just helps you. It's like an electricity which is helping you to experience, uh, helping mind to experience, but the consciousness itself is not experiencing anything. It's just enabling you to experience, right? Then we cannot say that it's a knower. We can just say that um, that consciousness is uh, helping you to know stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good analogy, and I'm I'm with you. Um, so it, it's it's so consciousness is. Right. It's just an awareful right. being, right? Right now, you're awareful, innocently. You're helplessly aware. Do you need to do anything to be aware right now, Ashish? No. But look at this. Suppose I say to you, listen, everyone, um, what is what, what is nine times uh, 20, um, something easy, nine times eight? Oh, thinking, thinking about effort. Look yeah. at this effort. Thank you. Right. And whatever the number is, doesn't matter. It's, you know, nine times eight, 72. Right. So, but suppose I give you something more complex and you're like, it's effort. It's really effort. It's effort to breathe. It's effort to think. It's effort to recall. It's effort to eat. It's effort to walk. It's effort to. How long can you remain happy? You know, have you ever heard those times where you're just happy for too long and you're just like tired of being happy? <laughs> Like, you know, you're just so overjoyed. You're like, okay, let me just get back to my peaceful mode. Right? Or laughing so much. And you just say, oh, too much. I've been laughing too much. I just want to get go back to my normal peaceful mode. Everything's effort. Even staying happy is an effort. But how much effort is it just to be conscious? You see? It's the most effortless thing. Because it is you. Because you are that very awareness, it's the most innocent, most ordinary, most effortless thing. Everything else is very hard in con contrast. And then in one last question, I'm sorry. So in so if we take all this into context, then all the Vedanta knowledge, moksha is happening at the empirical level. But if you go one level above it, there's nothing. like it, It's just existence and everything in that sense is mithya isn't it like it's all forms and objects and even our mind is object and we are trying to grasp for knowledge which is an object through an object but the existent consciousness is it's taking place in existence consciousness so everything even moksha is in that sense in that sense empirical and and a kind of like uh, i would 
to relate it like a mithya. Mithya in the sense which is yeah. um, dependent on consciousness. It's yeah, all, and, it, and, it? And, good. and also, look at this. There's one verse in Chandogya Upanishad that says, um, there's a thousand pots and your focus is on a thousand pots. How many how many differences are there in the world? A thousand, a lot of differences. But the wise person looks at a thousand pots, exact same thousand pots, not any different, recognizes only one. What's wrong with you? There's a thousand pots. No, there's only one. There's only one substance. One substance which is appearing as a thousand different pots. So this means what has the wise person recognized? Have they gotten rid of the thousand Pots? Have they gotten rid of their thoughts? Have they gotten rid of their mind? Because all of these spots represent changes. Your thoughts, your memories, and emotions, and desires. I haven't gotten rid of anything. I just changed my cognitive shift to the substance, which is the truth of all of my thoughts. Tell me one thought that you have where there's no consciousness in it. <laughs> you see? So what's always going to be the content, the ultimate content of your thoughts? It's going to be awareness, awareness, consciousness. So you have two thoughts. You have a duck thought and you have an uh, a elephant thought. The duck thought is gone. Elephant thought has come. Elephant thought is gone. Cow thought has come. But during the duck thought, I am. During the elephant thought, I am. During the cow thought, I am. So there's always one unchanging principle throughout these right phenomena that are going on, passing and going. And you can attribute whatever you want to the cow. You can go, oh, such a holy, oh, now I'm a holy knower. Oh, my knower is touched, so divine. Ah. And then a, a cow, not, not a cow, that's gone now. And now an elephant comes and it triggers a memory how an elephant ran through your grandfather's house and he totally demolished the whole place. And now you're an angry knower. Oh, how dare, you know? Look at this. Just constant phenomena changes happening at the level of the mind. But everywhere, throughout the holiness of the cow and the, the you know, the strut of the elephant, there is an I am. There's a presence in whose presence this phenomena is going on. And you need the pramana to come to this knowledge. And the pramana, what uses the pramana? Not consciousness. What uses the pramana? The mind which is pervaded by the consciousness. And therefore, just like this drik drishya, we come to see step by step that, you know, just like the, uh, the attributes don't contaminate the eye, the eye attributes don't contaminate the mind, and the mind attributes don't contaminate this ever-present knower, which is true throughout all all times, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Na jayate mriyate va kadachita na yam bhutva bhavita va na bhuyaha ajo nitya shashvato yam puranaha na hanyate hanyamane sharire This self is never born, nor does it die. It is not that having been, it ceases to exist again. It is unborn, eternal, undergoes no change whatsoever, and is ever new. When the body is destroyed, the self is not destroyed. So the body is destroyed. So this we have, um, it, it disintegrates. It uses the word sharira here again. And um, now what is not destroyed, your true nature is um, right, not destroyed. So the relationship we can use between the body and atma here is like the wave, right? What has birth in the ocean, right? The wave has birth. So now the birth of the wave, is that the birth of the water? No. So what is the birth of the wave actually? The birth of the wave is, is? Manifestation of water. Yeah, it's it's an it's 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 as though the water taking right some kind of a right difference to itself. But throughout the entirety of that wave, where can you not find the H2O? Right, so the entirety of that wave is entirely pervaded. There's no place where H2O is not, and it's not like the wave over there has H and this wave has O. This wave is just filled with H2O. That wave is filled with H2O. 
The only difference is in reference to the names and forms, the forms that the water is assuming to take in that moment. So in that same manner, your body is just a manifestation, assuming, right? Consciousness is assuming this form that you're carrying right now, your body. So this means I don't have to look out there in meditation for consciousness, right? It's right here. It's manifesting as this experience right now. So in this sense, right, there is one order of this reality, which is changing, which is disintegrating, which is going through and supposed to go through uh, evolution. And that is your body, whereas the content of the, the body, which is um, uh, like this water, which is consciousness. Now, then it says, who are you, therefore? If you are not this changing, disintegrating wave that's coming and crashing and changing forms, uh, who are you? You are Atma. That means it is that which doesn't undergo the modifications of the body. And how many modifications are there, if you remember? Six. 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 So it's Six. Asti, right? Fetus, Jayate, born, Vartate, grows. Uh, vi um, what's the next one? Viparina Mate, right? Viparina Mate. I think it's um, a maturity, Apakshiyate, which is, right? You start to decline and then Vinashati, you die. So this is the nature of the body. And none of these six ever pass onto you, Atma. And therefore, who are you? You are not Jayate Mriyate. You are that which doesn't come and go. Um, and what is the nature of this you, Atma? It is the nature of existence, Sat, which is of the nature of consciousness, uh, which is not divisible. It is not dividable. It's not like your consciousness is there and my consciousness is here. It's one all-pervasive consciousness. Therefore, it is what kind of an existence, a wherefore reality. It is uh, anantam. It is non-divisible. It is therefore everywhere. Non-divisible anantam just means, right, it's all-pervasive. Nothing, nothing limits it. When you limit something, it's not anantam. When it's not limited, then it's an anantam, okay? Therefore, and what is the, and in the presence of this atma, which is of the nature of existence and awareness, what does it do? It enables this person, this, this person, your name, to recognize the changes that are happening, not only to the person, but also to the world. So whatever is enabling the knowership, the knowing to take place, the changes that are to be going on, whatever is enabling that to take place, to be recognized is your final truth, is your final nature, okay? And both the world, right, and your body is, what's the word for it, if you remember? It starts with M. Mitya. Mitya, this means it's dependent. So what is the relationship between you and your body that you are carrying right now between the sharira and the shariri is a satya mitya relationship so this means there's no place right um your body is like this cup there's no place throughout this cup where uh, or this spot where the clay is not and this pot is what enables is what ultimately recognizes that changes are happening to this pot so the ultimate knower of the changes of this spot becomes, in this case, the clay. The ultimate knower that recognizes changes happening in reference to your body and your mind, which is nothing but consciousness itself, is uh, is consciousness itself. Okay. So therefore, there's not two things here. It's not like mitya is one thing and satyam, the clay, is another thing. It's one and the same reality looked at from two different standpoints. Okay. Therefore, the content of your entire being, of your entire body, becomes satyam. Um, and, and why is your body mitya? Why is the world mitya? This is a question for you. What makes the body mitya? What qualifies it to be mitya? Ever changing? It, it, depends, it depends on the uh, consciousness uh, because of which it's able to... Good, good. Um, ever changing ever changing and what do we say about mitya it is dependent reality and it is reducible to yeah. knowledge concept yeah it is good excellent so in other words show me one part of your body that is not reducible 
right now. Look at any part of your physical body that's not reducible. Confine it. So it reduces, your physical body reduces ultimately to the smallest, this is just science, to the smallest particles, to, you know, to quarks. And then Vedanta takes over and it says that you cannot find the final building block because even if you reduce that quark to, you can in, reduce it infinite amount of times, you will still not come to the final building block of the universe. So now you need Vedanta to take over and say the final block of the the final building block of the universe is concepts. That means uh, you cannot see a concept, but you can only see its effects. You can't see intelligence. You can only see the effects of intelligence. And what are the effects of intelligence? Particles, atoms, molecules, silica, pot, uh, clay, pot. Okay. Therefore, every form in this universe, you apply this to your body, you apply this to anything in this world, you will ultimately reduce it into particles. And particles themselves are intelligently put together. Therefore, they are not random. They're intelligently put together to create the next level of assembly until you have the smallest, like an atom going into a seed and then a seed itself where is intelligence? Can you see this intelligence inside a seed? No. But what can you see when that seed grows? You can see effects of the intelligence that was inside that seed. You understand? Therefore, you cannot see intelligence. You can only see the byproducts of intelligence. And how do those byproducts manifest as the world that you see, that I see, that we experience? And therefore, everything in the universe, including your thoughts, mind you, because what's the difference between a rock and your subtle body? So last week, someone asked, you know, this is easy in reference to physical forms, but what about our thoughts? Same thing. Your thoughts are also made out of matter, just subtler matter, more flexible matter. Matter is able to mold and shape, kind of like dream matter. It's also the same thing, just concepts. Concepts reduce ultimately to concepts. And what is the content of concepts? Vedanta says it is consciousness, which is known to you right now as effortless amnes. All right? So in this sense, the whole world, including physical and subtle matter, reduces into intelligence or concepts, and concepts themselves have no reality without their final uh, being the final existence, which is satanchit, existence awareness, which is un, which is not limited. It is infinite. Therefore, nothing limits existence awareness because the whole thing is existence awareness. Therefore, it is anantam. It is limitless. I'm not going to ask a question now, uh, Amo. I just want to finish this. All right. Now, what else is... Um, the nature of Atma, it is Nityam. Now, uh, last week we uh, brought a good uh, discussion and we said the definition of real. And we said, what is the definition of real? And we said it is what is always true yesterday, is equally true today, and is equally true tomorrow. Now, if you take those three packets of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and you stack them, and you stack them together, when will... When will that which is real ever be different? You understand? So you don't have to now right. analyze and go into, into these huge formulas. Well, let me think 10 billion years ago. Just take yesterday, today, and tomorrow. What was true yesterday, today, and tomorrow? One consciousness, one awareness. And you take those three, therefore that same awareness was eternally as it is. Therefore it is nityam. It is eternal. And time itself becomes a superimposition superimposed on awareness, just like anything else. How do you show this? How do you show that time is superimposed on your awareness? Well, time itself is perceivable. For example, um, I right, suppose, I mean, a common example I'll use is you're having a dinner and you're enjoying your dinner a lot and it's only five minutes. You're dating for five minutes, right? It's a speeding date. And you're loving this date. It's so awesome, right? And like, oh my God, this is an awesome person. You know, they have these skills. I want to talk to them. 
and and before before you even get any real insights time's up five minutes oh my god right so it's just gone so quickly um, conversely you can be on a bus stop and waiting um, for your bus to come and you just want the bus to come right it's cold and you're just waiting five minutes it's like forever so this means right like this time can also be perceived differently by the perceiver but uh, so in that sense it is superimposed on whom the the ultimate knower of that time which is consciousness okay so it is netyam Nityam means it is eternal. What is eternal? Atma is eternal. What is Atma? Your nature. And then your nature is also Shashwata. Shashwata means um, you do not go und undergo any change whatsoever. And, um, and we use an example of this, like a white screen, a metaphor. And we said that the white screen remains the white screen throughout the villain and the hero throwing their uh, you know, exchanges of uh, weaponry and fights and, uh, you know, wars and huggings. This is drama going on on this, on this final substratum, which is you. So in that sense, you do not undergo any changes. You remain free of the, of the happenings of your body and your mind. Yeah, but I don't experience myself being free of the happenings of my body and mind, objects the mind. How will we counter this? Suppose you say you don't feel free of your, uh, of 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 the body and mind. How will we counter this? Because I've taken myself to be a body and mind, therefore that has become my uh, present reality, and therefore I don't feel free from it. Yeah, but see now, this is a kind of a trick question. Am I not imply? Am I implying that a wise person is feeling everywhere? They're like they're just all over the place now. That the Buddha, right? Our Ramanas are just everywhere now. Is no. this what I'm implying? No. No, for him, there there is uh, he knows that there is an experiential reality, and he also knows there is a parmarthik satya. So while living in experiential reality, he is aware that everything what appears is finally Brahman. It, so I would rather say that aware recognizes cognitively that even though there is right these forms, the truth of these forms upon analysis is concepts, and concepts ultimately resolve into consciousness. So I want to keep on reminding us that a wise person is not experiencing something new because Atma is never produced. Okay? Atma, your nature cannot be produced. What do you want to be produced? Okay, suppose you want enlightenment to be something. What, what exactly do you want it to be? Suppose. Simple question. I want enlightenment to be something. What, what exactly do you want it to be? Notice whatever answer you give me is going to be an idea, your idea. I ask another person, it's going to be their idea. So it's got nothing to do with the fact. It's got to do with the person's own preferences. So we have to first let you know, forget about it. It's not anything. It's just, it's not produced. It is your, it's the most evident, the most, uh, the most familiar presence, which is you. Therefore, you are never produced. Otherwise, if you were produced, if you want enlightenment to be a production of something new, what does that mean? It and means changing. It, yeah, it means that the present you would go out of existence to give way to some enlightened person. You understand this? If I want enlightenment to be something new, that means I have to destroy myself and give birth to something that has no connection to this one. So then who's going to be enjoying the benefits of liberation? Then who wants liberation? It, it requires a destruction of me. You understand? So the logic breaks down. So it cannot be something new because it is, it is your, you know, it is consciousness. You cannot produce consciousness. It is already evident to everyone. So it's just a recognition that I'm already that right now. And what else is Atma? It is Purana. Purana means it is ever new. It remains always as itself. So for example, space. I can host a party here in my room and we can have a, a naughty party of a lot of lights and a lot of food and uh, big loud music. The moment that music is gone, has space taken on any of those tunes of that music? No. 
Has space become naughty because of our party? No. Same thing. I can now bring in a Brahmana to do a little puja for us and chant the entire Rig Veda, Sama Veda, even more beautiful. And now the space is filled with beautiful, harmonious tunes. And then the Brahmana, sadly, at least for me, leaves. I pay him the money. Then the, is, is now the space more sacred? <laughs> no, okay. So it's not more sacred space. <laughs> Then why do we say, you know, let's let's hold the sacred space, right? So why do we say that? We only say that in reference to the walls that we and all the objects that we put inside that room. The moment you put those walls down, and it right in one instant, those terms that you've assigned that you've superimposed onto space, they're all gone. So this means you've created this term under the pretext, under the context of it being surrounded by objects, but space all along was entirely free, always itself, never contaminated by anything. In that same way, you can be a naughty child, you can be like this, you can be like that, but you cognitively, your buddhi cognitively understands, even though it seems like it, this is all fine, but in actuality, I remain like space, free, attributeless myself. And I always have been like that since beginningless time, and I'm even like that right now. Urana, ever new, ever fresh, ever itself. Ellie? But yeah, what you're saying is like, so the music, when the music's done, it doesn't change anything. But it, like if you listen to Gandharva, I think it is like the different times of the day in that, I think it does change like energetically. I, um, yeah, sure. I that... of, of course, it changes um, energetically. Now, I think you're using slightly different context of the example. I was specifically referring to space. So the space itself doesn't take on any attributes. And then I, and then I said, Atma is like that. It never takes on attributes, right, of what your mind goes through. So your mind can now be energized by this party. And you can be feeling great about yourself. But it, it's not touching the light in whose presence this energetic mind is now buzzing. Okay. So the next verse, verse 21, Arjuna will be reminded of his duty once again, now having heard about the nature of these soldiers that he thinks is he's going to kill. So let's see if Arjuna's stance is going to change in the next verse. Maybe I'll ask a question. Uh, verse 20, right? So what does it mean for Atma to be eternal and unchanging? Uh, eternal means uh, present in all three periods of time. Excellent. Uh, discovering that the deathless factor in you. Yeah, good. So the discovering and, and and relating to right to that to, through knowledge that my true nature is deathless. It's immortal, and thereby you can right honor your body and honor this sharira that has been given to you to figure that out, and thereby you can now carry this sharira with gratitude. Thank Lord I've been given this body to figure this out. Can I please check whether I've got this right? Can I just do it in, in my way? So please. in a simple terms, so if this is so-called the real me, so this is a water bottle, you can, I hope you can see it. Mm -hmm. So then uh, you're born, so you're small, you're, 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 you're born, you have your life, you start, then slowly you grow older, then you become your mind, your, uh, you know, all your things, you know, you start growing, your ego goes big and everything. But still, you are there behind. Uh, that is the real you. Yeah. And what we do is we always believe that this is the real person. So our perception is all here. Yeah. And this shift from here to here is what we are looking at. Is that, is that That's right? it. And that shift is a cognitive shift. It's not an experiential shift. Okay. So yes, this is a very nice example that Bhuvana used. And I will replicate it. Um, so we have, um, right? So this is, we call this Upadhi. Just one more little thing. So we call this upa, um, upahita. Upahita is your true nature. Upahita is awareness. And upahita specifically means that which as though takes on attributes. Not actually, but as though takes on attributes. And all of these things that you mentioned, Bhuvana, like the ego and the body, this is called upadhi. Upadhi specifically means that which as though lends its attributes to something else but not actually, it doesn't actually lend those attributes. 
So now look at this. You're looking at pure self, that which illumines all of your thoughts of different flavors, different colors, and so on. So now when the thought comes, suppose, right, the entirety, like this whole thing is now blue. Look at this. It's blue, right? And now you look at your, your consciousness and you go, oh, look, I, I am blue, right? And then I put a red shirt and then you go, I am red, right? So this means now is the, is the blueness actually contaminating or passing onto this? Not actually. Okay. It's only as though lending its attributes onto consciousness, but you know, in your, ex you recognize in your experience that nothing sticks onto you. And how do you understand this logically that nothing sticks onto you? Look at this logic. So now we have blue, blue, and then we have red, and then we have green. Now, in real life, these colors are constantly one behind each other, right? They're never like space. You never see pure consciousness. It's always as though, right, conditioned by the upadi. But through logic, you say, look, the fact that this blue can instantly get replaced by red, can instantly get replaced by green, can instantly get replaced by black, it means that it never took on the attributes of the blue, it never took on the attributes of the red, it never took on the attributes of the green, it never took on the attributes of the black. Purnamadav, Purnamidam, Purnat, Purnamudachete, Purnasya, Purnamadaya, Purnam Eva Vashishyate, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.